Our next topic is a review of radiculopathies and plexopathies. And again, these are meant to be quick reviews, so um, you may want to stop occasionally um, and review some of the anatomy as we go through this uh, if you need some time to uh, pull things together. So we've been uh, sort of uh, doing a quick review of the neuroaxis, and we've done muscle, neuromuscular junction, peripheral nerve, and in this lecture we're going to lump together roots and plexus, so radiculopathies and plexopathies. So key findings with both radiculopathies and plexopathies is that patients are going to have focal weakness, focal sensory loss, and focal reflex changes. And so um, you really need to understand the neuroanatomy of roots and plexus in patients that come in uh, with these focal findings. Um, and um, these are satisfying to localize. If you know the anatomy, well, you usually can identify exactly what root and exactly what part of the plexus is involved. Both radiculopathies and plexopathies are painful. And we use the term radicular pain in patients that have radiculopathies. So they're going to have neck or low back pain with shooting, electrical burning pain that is in uh, whatever root is involved. So if a patient has a C6 radiculopathy, they're going to tell you, for example, it goes right down to the thumb. Okay, and so often just the history will suggest what part of the roots or plexus are involved. All right, so for just a little review here, we have uh, the spinal cord. Here's the anterior horn cell. And so this is the motor nerve root. And then here we have the dorsal root ganglion and the sensory nerve root here. And so radiculopathies, like if it's due to a disc or other mass lesion, generally we're going to have both motor and sensory nerve roots that are involved here. And of course, the roots come together as the spinal nerve, and then not shown here or drawn, but um, then of course we go from roots to plexus, and then from plexus to individual nerves that supply specific muscles, in this case the femoral nerve that supplies the quadriceps. So we can see that radiculopathies and plexopathies, because all of this is lower motor neuron, right, from the anterior horn cell all the way out to the muscle. And so whether it's a radiculopathy or a plexopathy, it's going to interfere with the reflex loop. And so patients will have, uh, if, the, if this is an L2, 3, or 4 radiculopathy, or a lumbar plexopathy, then the patella reflex is going to be absent. And we could have other lower motor neuron findings over time, such as atrophy of the quadriceps muscle. All right, so we'll come back to spinal stenosis here at the very end of the lecture, but in younger individuals particularly, related to uh, maybe an injury or lifting something, uh, we can have a disc herniation, and again, that's going to involve motor and sensory nerve roots. So let's start with the upper extremity. Um, and so the roots that supply uh, the upper extremity are C5 through T1. So we can see the nerve roots coming out here. And then we have the plexus. And the uh, plexus is often difficult to remember. Um, uh, just a few big picture points. Very helpful to know that the clavicle, when the arms are at the side, the clavicle overlies the divisions. And so we speak of a plexus that is above the clavicle, that's a supraclavicular plexus, and an infraclavicular plexus. And this has been helpful to me uh, many times. So someone comes into the emergency room with some sort of trauma, gunshot wound, stab wound, something like that, and the arm is weak. Well, uh, was the injury above or below the clavicle? If it's above the clavicle, you know it has to be of the roots. If it's below the clavicle, then the problem is going to be with the uh, cords. Now, the divisions, of course, could be involved as well, um, depending on how close the lesion is to the clavicle. Um, so the lesion would be of the cords or the proximal branches of the individual nerves here, like median, ulnar, and radial. Overall, super, supraclavicular plexopathies are much more common and overall, radiculopathies are much more common than plexopathies. And so I'm not going to talk through all of this, but if you want to remind yourself of some of the, um, you know, how things get from where to where in the plexus, I would just stop the video for a second. I'll just make a couple of points here. It is not easy to distinguish sometimes radiculopathies from plexopathies. Occasionally, 
Um, for example, if we're aware that the dorsal scapular nerve comes off at the root level and the long thoracic nerve comes off at the root level, so for dorsal scapular C5, long thoracic is C5, C6, and a little C7. So if we have scapular winging or weakness of the rhomboids muscle here for dorsal scapular, then <clears throat> the lesion has to be proximal to the roots. Okay, remember there's only one nerve that comes off at the root level, that suprascapular nerve, which supplies infraspinatus and supraspinatus. And then we have a couple important sensory nerves here, the medial anterior cutaneous, uh, that supplies the medial forearm off the medial cord here, and the lateral anterior cutaneous that supply, supplies the lateral um, forearm. <clears throat> and so one way of uh, just testing your knowledge of this is uh, just to think about the median nerve, which is really very complex. So the motor contribution to the median nerve comes from C8, T1, inferior trunk, medial cord, and then down to the median nerve. So all these median muscles in the hand um, are supplied by C8, T1, inferior trunk, whereas sensation for the median nerve um, comes up this way to C6 and C7 nerve roots. So if we have someone with a severe median neuropathy like carpal tunnel syndrome, well, the thumb is C6, um, digits two, three, and four in the palm are made mainly C7, so that's the sensory contribution, whereas the muscle that uh, is usually weak in carpal tunnel is abductor pollicis brevis, and uh, that's a lot of T1, a little C8, inferior trunk like this. Now there is, um, there are two exceptions. There are two motor um, uh, contributions to the median nerve that come from C6, C7. It's not shown here, uh, but I just wanted to illustrate as kind of a, a big picture um, the importance of spending a little time understanding the wiring of the median nerve. All right, so we're going to go through different muscles that will be weak in C5, C6 radiculopathies. And these look very much like a superior trunk plexopathy. Um, C7 radiculopathy, more than half of all radiculopathies in the upper extremity are C7. And so that would be really important to distinguish. Medial trunk plexopathies um, almost never occur in isolation. So we really want to focus here on C7 radiculopathies. And then we'll focus on C8, T1 radiculopathies and lower trunk or inferior trunk um, plexopathies. All right, so let's start here in red with C5-6. And so we can see that this comes together to form the superior trunk. Here's the suprascapular nerve supplying infraspinatus and supraspinatus. And then from here, we have a straight shot down to the lateral cord musculocutaneous to biceps. Okay, so if we have a patient with either a C5-6 radiculopathy or a superior trunk plexopathy, they're both going to have weakness of supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and um, biceps, okay, and there is a division from the superior trunk that goes to the posterior cord, all right, and so the posterior cord, of course, uh, off of this we have the axillary nerve, which supplies deltoids, so that will be weak in a C5-6 radiculopathy or a superior trunk plexopathy, and from the posterior cord we have the radial nerve, um, and uh, a key muscle here that can be helpful for C5-6 radiculopathy or superior trunk plexopathy is brachioradialis. So brachioradialis is C5-6, and so the nerve fibers come this direction. So here are, in red, uh, some of the muscles that would be really helpful to evaluate um, in a C5-6 radiculopathy, superior trunk plexopathy. They should be weak. All right, so here is deltoids. External rotation here, the patient's pushing out with their wrists against the examiner's hands. This would be infraspinatus. Um, here is uh, how to evaluate the uh, supraspinatus uh, muscle. Biceps, again, C5-6, and brachioradialis. If the patient tries to move their thumb to their shoulder, here's the brachioradialis muscle right here. So it works with the biceps for elbow flexion. All right, now if we go to C7, the muscles that will be weak here, and remember this is half, more than half of all radiculopathies, so C7 is really common. So it goes from the C7 root to the middle trunk to the posterior cord, down to the radial nerve, 
And so these two muscles here, extensor digitorum, so for extending the fingers, and the triceps. Triceps would be the key muscle um, here that is weak in a C7 radiculopathy. All right, but the C7 root also contributes a division to the lateral cord and down to the median nerve. And so I told you there's an exception. Not all of the median muscles come from C8, T1, and this is one of the exceptions. But since C7 radiculopathies are so common, this is really worthwhile knowing here. And so this contribution to the median nerve supplies pronator teres. So these three muscles would be the key muscles to evaluate for a C7 radiculopathy. All right, so here's triceps, patient's trying to extend their arm. Pronator teres, so you ask the patient, you know, pretend like we're wrestling here. You turn your hand down, and so you can feel the pronator teres muscle here in the forearm as the patient is trying to turn in the hand. And then we can check finger extension. Okay, and again, that's a pretty solid C7 and some C8 um, in that muscle as well. Now, when we get down here into blue, C8, T1 radiculopathies or inferior trunk plexopathies, notice I just put the hand here because these fibers, as they go down to the medial cord, then supply the median and ulnar nerves, which are all of the hand muscles. So either C8, T1 or inferior trunk lesions, the patient's going to have a lot of hand weakness. And so um, here are the median and ulnar muscles in the hand that will be weak. We have the patient lift the thumb up. That's abductor pollicis brevis. That's a median nerve muscle, C8, T1, inferior trunk. Flexor pollicis longus is a median muscle. Again, C8, T1, inferior trunk. And the median nerve also flexes the index finger, flexor digitorum profundus to the second digit. So all three of these up here are median. The ulnar nerve here supplies the first dorsal interosseus. So we're pushing in against the index finger. The patient's trying to uh, AB duct. And the first dorsal interosseus muscle is right here in the hand. And so that's a good ulnar nerve, C8, T1, inferior trunk muscle. And then uh, fifth, di fifth digit abduction, and the, you can feel the uh, hypothenar eminence right there. Uh, so this is abductor digiti minimi and that's a good ulnar nerve muscle to check in the hand. So all of these will be weak uh, with C8, T1. So here are the reflexes that can be checked. And again, radiculopathies and plexopathies are lower motor neurons. So if we have either a C5, 6 radiculopathy or a superior trunk plexopathy, the biceps reflex and the brachioradialis reflex will be diminished. If we have a C7 radiculopathy, then we just said the triceps is weak, and so the triceps reflex will be diminished. So um, last time we mentioned carpal tunnel syndrome is the most common cause of a numb hand. Uh, C7 radiculopathy is probably the second most common cause of a numb hand. So again, there we're going to have that triceps weakness and uh, loss of the triceps um, reflex. Notice we really don't have a good C8-T1 reflex. All right, and so we, we do better with reflex testing here for um, C5, 6, and C7 radiculopathies. All right, so in terms of the sensory complaints here, uh, C5 nerve root supplies the lateral shoulder. C6 goes down into the uh, lateral forearm, into the thumb. C7 is digits 2, 3, and 4 in the palm. C8 is the fifth digit, and T1 goes up the medial forearm. Now, there is some overlap. A lot of dermatoma maps show C uh, show the index finger as C7. And so, you know, there's some debate on that. I think it can be C6 or C7, but we shouldn't make too big of a deal of that. So again, in all of these radiculopathies, uh, we'll look for that focal um, sensory loss. So here's a nice uh, drawing showing you, you know, patient with C5 is going to have numbness here, C6 down to the thumb. And again, this drawing shows the index finger is C6, C7, more of the palm and uh, digits uh, three and four, C8, fifth digit, T1, the medial forearm. Okay, now if we have an upper trunk or superior trunk, that's just gonna be a combination of C5 and C6, right? So now it's gonna be the lateral shoulder and going all the way down to the hand. 
And if we have a lower trunk or inferior trunk, that's just going to be a combination of CAT1. So now it's going to be the medial forearm and all the way down to the fourth and fifth digits. All right, so cord lesions I mentioned are less common, um, but uh, let's just talk here a little bit. If we have a lateral cord lesion, well, weakness is going to be in the musculocutaneous biceps muscle and down into the uh, median nerve. So again, the pronator teres would be weak. If we have a posterior cord lesion, that's going to look a lot like a radial neuropathy, right? Wrist drop, finger drop, weakness of triceps. But since the axillary nerve also comes off the posterior cord, we're going to have some weakness in the axillary nerve. And a medial cord plexopathy will look a lot like a CAT1 inferior trunk plexopathy, right? So we're going to have all that ulnar nerve, median nerve weakness. Um, the biggest difference is that the CAT1 inferior trunk um, does contribute to the radial nerve. And so we won't have any radial nerve involvement with a medial cord lesion. All right, so um, here is just kind of everything we just talked about here. So if you want to pause the video, you can spend just a minute looking over that. All right, and, uh, and again, just a picture here showing you what a lateral, medial, and posterior cord sensory distribution will look like. So it's worthwhile just spending another moment on C7 radiculopathies since these are so common. So here's the lesion, all right? And so the weakness is going to be in radial muscles, triceps and finger extension, and also in the, the median muscle here uh, that's supplied by C7 pronator teres. So this will be the sensory distribution in the C7 radiculopathy here in the hand, weakness of pronator teres, triceps, and uh, finger extensors, and some wrist extensors, and we'll lose that triceps reflex. Now in terms of uh, plexus lesions, um, many things can affect the superior trunk. I think the one you should know is Herb's palsy. That would be most often asked on a board question. And so this is an obstetrical palsy, so it's usually a difficult delivery, and the lesion is of the superior trunk. And so these babies, typically, it's drawn here as an adult, but have what's known as the waiter's tip position. And so they're just noticed after delivery not to be moving the arm very well, and the hand is in this position. So why does it take this position? Well, notice here that the uh, infraspinatus, remember, is external rotation, the supraspinatus is abduction of the arm, and so the arm can't abduct, so it gets pulled to the chest. It can't uh, externally rotate, and so the arm internally rotates. And so it moves into this classic position, all right? And so C5, C6 sensory fibers uh, obviously are a continuation here for the superior trunk. So we get sensory loss in a C5, C6 distribution. And of course, you'd never be able to evaluate that um, in an infant. But if it were an adult, you'd have that sort of sensory loss. But we do have these objective um, superior trunk reflexes here, biceps and brachioradialis. So those should be diminished. All right now, I think three things worthwhile knowing that affect the inferior trunk. Cancer. Um, will often affect the inferior trunk, so especially lung cancer. And so these are the patients we talk about that have Horner syndrome because the sympathetic pathway going up to the pupil um, travels right along with this part of the plexus. So a patient with lung cancer and a Horner syndrome may have uh, an inferior trunk plexopathy as well. Um, really worthwhile knowing because this is fairly common after open heart surgery, due to excessive retraction of the rib cage, um, this can stretch the inferior trunk. And so after surgery, these patients are going to have hand weakness, and they're going to have numbness in the fourth and fifth digits, and they're usually felt to have an ulnar neuropathy. But the lesion is more proximal. It's in the uh, inferior trunk. And then another obstetrical palsy, much less common than Herb's palsy, um, is Klumke's palsy. And the lesion here is of the inferior trunk, and so unlike Herb's palsy, they're not going to have that waiter's tip position. They will just be noted to have um, hand weakness. They're not moving that hand very well after delivery. All right, so here's an inferior trunk lesion. 
And so again, we're going to have that CAT1 sensory loss, so medial forearm, fifth digit. They're going to have a lot of median, ulnar, and radial weakness. So ulnar, median, radial weakness, because all of those motor fibers, um, or all those nerves, I should say, have a contribution from the inferior trunk. Now, the only cord lesion I'll mention specifically is a lateral cord lesion, which we see as part of post-radiation plexopathy. So these are usually women that have breast cancer, and uh, a long time, years after radiation treatment, they present with a lateral cord plexopathy. And so, remember I mentioned that the median nerve sensory fibers go this direction. And so the initial complaint is usually numbness, sensory loss, in a median nerve distribution. So we might think, oh, the patient has carpal tunnel syndrome, but if they've had radiation treatment for breast cancer, then we're concerned that they might have this post-radiation plexopathy. And unfortunately, sadly, this radiation um, damage usually spreads to involve uh, more of the plexus. All right, let's get down to the lower extremities a little bit. So we'll be going over um, we'll lump L234 nerve roots with the lumbar plexus, so there's a lot of overlap there, and L5S1 with the sacral plexus. All right, so here we see L234 roots becoming the lumbar plexus, and so we can see the femoral nerve and the obturator nerve come off of L234 lumbar plexus. Uh, we'll say something about the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, uh, really important. Uh, sensory branch here. And then the sacral plexus, L5-S1, there's a little contribution from uh, L4. And so again, we have the sciatic nerve here. Sorry about my dog in the background there. Um, we have the sciatic nerve. And uh, importantly here, we have uh, the superior gluteal nerve, gluteus medius, and inferior gluteal nerve, uh, gluteus maximus. Okay, and these come off proximal to the uh, sciatic nerve. And I'll show you how to examine those muscles. And then, of course, the sciatic nerve becomes the uh, perineal or fibular and uh, tibial nerves. Okay, so for um, L234 nerve roots and lumbar plexus, here are three good muscles we can uh, examine. Hip flexion is iliacus. If we ask the patient to straighten the leg out, that's quadriceps. Okay, and then um, the adductors, like adductor magnus, so we ask the patient to push the knees together and the examiner's trying to push out. Um, that would be another good L234 muscle um, and lumbar plexus. So these muscles will be weak with either L234 radiculopathies or lumbar plexopathies. All right, for the L5 nerve root, um, gluteus medius is hip abduction, and that is a really solid L5 muscle. Hamstrings are L5 and some S1, so uh, knee flexion here is hamstrings. All right, and down in the foot, and let me just show uh, another uh, diagram here. Um, L5 and some S1 everts and inverts the foot, and foot dorsiflexion is L4 and L5. So in an L5 radiculopathy, this usually presents with a foot drop, but the patient is also likely to have weakness of foot eversion, that's perineus longus, and foot inversion, which is posterior tibialis. Plantar flexion is S1, S2, that's tibial nerve, so that's not going to be weak in an L5 radiculopathy. Okay, and I just want to remind you from anatomy that if you have weakness of the gluteus medius, um, typically from an L5 radiculopathy, or it could be a superior gluteal nerve um, injury, which is not very common, that you get that contralateral um, hip drop in that situation. Now, by far the most common radiculopathy in the lower extremity is S1, so this would be um, probably the most common board radiculopathy question that you'll get. And so here the patient's going to have back pain, shooting pain down the back of the leg, and here are some good S1 muscles. So gluteus medius, we ask the patient to lie on their back and lift their leg up like this. I'm sorry, I, I meant to say gluteus maximus. Gluteus maximus is a good S1 muscle. Plantar flexion, 
is gastrocnemia here. That's an S1 and some S2. And hamstrings, I mentioned, are L5 and S1. So all muscles have two nerve roots that supply them. So hamstrings is a good way to evaluate both L5 and S1. So for reflex testing, if a patient has an L2, 3, 4 radiculopathy or a lumbar plexopathy, the patella reflex will be absent. Notice we do not have a good L5 reflex, and so you can check the hamstrings reflex, but that's hard to get in a normal individual. But we have a great reflex for S1 radiculopathies, and that is the Achilles reflex. All right, so in terms of sensory, uh, big picture, L2 is a more proximal thigh, L3 is around the knee, L4, and this is very helpful to know, supplies the medial calf and down to the big toe. L5 has most of the dorsum of the foot and the lateral shin. And another really nice diagram here, again, L2 is the more proximal thigh, L3 is the knee, L4 is the medial calf, um, L5 here uh, gets a lot of the dorsum of the foot, uh, more towards the big toe, whereas S1 gets the more outer part of the foot and most of the dorsum of the foot. And again, if you look at dermatomal maps, you're going to see a lot of variations on this, but, but this is a good, uh, I think, good representation here. So if we have a lumbar plexus lesion, remember that's going to be L2, 3, 4. So we have all of these roots together, L2, L3, L4 down in the medial calf. And uh, uh, the sacral plexus here is going to be an L5, S1 distribution. So the lateral leg, most all of the dorsum of the foot and the plantar aspect of the foot would be involved. All right, now cauda equina syndrome is simply bilateral lumbosacral radiculopathies. And so again, these are, these are nerve roots, it's lower motor neurons. So patients with cauda equina syndrome will have absent leg reflexes and bilateral leg weakness. Okay, because you involve a lot of the sacral roots, you're going to have bowel and bladder dysfunction, sexual dysfunction in men, and inability to have an erection, and we'll look for that involvement of the sacral three through five dermatomes. Okay, so sort of perianal uh, sensory loss or a saddle anesthesia. This can be difficult to sort out from a conus medullaris lesion at the tip of the cord, but of course here we have some upper motor neurons in the spinal cord, right? So we'll look for a Babinski sign or clonus or something that would suggest it's upper motor neuron. So that is a very important feature. Cauda equina syndrome, you're only allowed to have lower motor neuron findings, loss of reflexes. Conus medullaris lesions, uh, tend to have mainly sacral involvement. So if we're seeing a lot of uh, you know, lumbar distribution weakness, that would go a little bit more with cauda equina syndrome. Radiculopathies tend to be much more painful. So lesions of the spinal cord are overall less painful. Um, cauda equina syndrome tends to be more asymmetrical. You're gonna involve the roots in one leg more than the other. If we have a lesion at the tip of the conus, we're gonna get more perfectly symmetrical findings. And also, when the lesions in the cord, the bowel and bladder dysfunction, um, and probably uh, sexual dysfunction, will be more prominent. So there's a lot of overlap, but those are some of the distinguishing findings. But just remember, if you've got a patient in the uh, emergency room with you know bilateral leg weakness, and you're worried about cauda equina syndrome, they should not have reflexes. I'll only mention one specific. Um, lumbosacral plexopathy. So we can have, you know, cancer can involve the plexus, radiation, but this one is really worthwhile knowing, a retroperitoneal hemorrhage. So these are patients that are in the hospital on IV heparin, and they have an acute hemorrhage into the retroperitoneum, okay, and the lumbar plexus is formed right there um, um, in that area. So when you have a retroperitoneal hemorrhage, the hematoma involves the lumbar plexus, which we can see right here. So these patients are going to have weakness in with adduction, obturator nerve, and in the femoral distribution, so uh, quadriceps, and the nerve to iliacus here, which is hip flexion. And they're going to have sensory loss in the L2, 3, 4 distribution. So we're looking here at the medial aspect of the left leg, so it's the thigh, knee, medial calf area. 
And of course, the patella reflex is L234, so that's going to be absent. So that comes on acutely in a hospitalized patient. Stop the heparin right away, get a CT to find the hematoma, and uh, these usually clear up pretty well. Now, this is really not a radiculopathy or a plexopathy, but uh, I, very important you're aware of lateral femoral cutaneous neuropathy or neuralgia paresthetica. And so the nerve here is damaged in the groin area. And these are usually overweight individuals in particular that wear tight belts. And so they complain of numbness and tingling and pain in the lateral thigh. And they, so they have sensory distribution there. But this is a pure sensory nerve. So there's no weakness, no reflex changes. Okay, and so often a story will be a police officer, someone who works for the electric company. They've got big tight belts and uh, they come in with this sensory loss. But unlike a radiculopathy or plexopathy, they're not weak. There are no reflex changes. Okay, lastly, just a couple board relevant points. If you have a patient with back pain or neck pain, these are very, very common, but they don't have weakness, sensory loss, reflex changes. This is musculoskeletal. All right, so a normal exam, don't do an MRI scan. Treat these conservatively, like with non-steroidals, um, but uh, you know, don't go for MRI imaging or EMG testing or refer to the patient to surgery. Treat it conservatively. Okay, and then lastly, spinal stenosis without radiculopathy. So the patient has lumbar stenosis or cervical stenosis. Your exam's gonna be normal because the roots are not involved. And what's called neurogenic claudication is fairly common, which refers to the, the symptoms, usually pain, that are worse with walking, especially in an erect posture. And so if the vignette gives you improvement in symptoms when bending forward, the uh, so-called shopping cart sign, then you know you're dealing um, with uh, typically a lumbar um, stenosis. And again, you're gonna treat that 